My name is Holly Corman. Um, currently, I'm principal at uh, a K-6 school in Cambridge. I started with Social Planning Council many, many years ago when I first started teaching, so almost 30 years ago. And uh, back in those days, they, at the beginning of the year, we would have this before school even started meeting, and it was so far back that we actually had a Women's Teachers Federation. And they would uh, post all these different organizations and things that were looking for teacher representation. Social Planning Council was one of those, and I, I joined on, fresh-faced and green, um, deciding that that was something that kind of appealed to me. My background um, is Mennonite from Poole, Ontario, and uh, that idea of communities helping out each other and being there for each other was something that made sense to me. KW was the first city I'd ever lived in, and so I was intrigued by the concept of, of maybe taking that idea of a small town helping each other out and, and transferring that to the big city, as it seemed to me at the time. So that's how you first got involved yeah. with uh, social I was a member at large. And why? Your role, your involvement, you were a member at large at first? And For the first involved. two years, I believe, I was a member at large, and then there was a lot of transformation that happened within Social Planning Council. I had a number of roles during that time. Um, we lost funding. Um, I remember going to United Way to, to plead our case a number of time, a number of years in a row um, and trying to, to keep the funding coming. I'm not sure what my, my name or my role was of, during that particular time. I, um, and I remember at some point then we, we lost our executive director and we lost a lot of funding. And I remember how complicated the structure of Social Planning Council was because there was Social Planning Council, there was LAMP that was kind of the, the event or fundraising arm I used to try and think, try and keep it straight in my head as the, the, the money came in with, with LAMP. And um, that was kind of the baby of the then executive director, the, the public face seemed to be going out and doing speaking engagements, that kind of thing. And then the Community Information Center. And I never quite understood how they all fit together. And I remember being confused for the first year anyway about who was doing what and what that role was that. And it seemed like there were kind of three different entities under one umbrella. That was Social Planning Council, but then they would talk about social planning too. So it, it was confusing to me. And then when um, the funding left, um, at that time I think I was either president or moving into that role and um, started looking more closely at the books and those kinds of things like if all this funding is is gone how can we how can we keep going forward because there's people who work there too in that community information center so there needed to be money coming in somehow to be able to pay these people to do the good work that they were doing and um, one of the big things I noted then was that we seemed to be paying a lot for a treasurer and it didn't seem that we had that much money coming in that we need to be paying $25,000 for somebody who was treasurer. So um, I, I made the decision to see if we could find a volunteer to do that. And uh, we found um, a volunteer from, I think it was Manulife, one of the big insurance companies, Jeff, and apparently he was there for quite some time. And uh, I'm not a money person at all, so he, that was a lot of insight for me. Um, it just seemed logical to me that if somebody could do that legitimately for free and he felt good about it and the organization got to move forward and the people that were working there got to continue to get a paycheck, it seemed a win-win situation all the way around. Um, we, we did go through a strategic planning at that time trying to figure out whether or not we needed to exist if, if the community was pulling all the funding, um, did we really need to exist? So there was a, a time where we did kind of hit the pavement and find out what people said. They did say that they wanted us to be around, but certainly we couldn't continue the way we had before. Um, well, roughly, what years are we talking about? Roughly. I'm 97, 98. Yeah. 97, 98? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm thinking about yeah. some future <laughs> yeah. historian. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. So um, 
Yeah, there was, there was a lot of um, talking to the, the public because when we were, I remember going through the, the search for a new executive director and it was pretty clear through that search that people didn't have a clue what it was that Social Planning Council was doing. Some, but I remember one person showed up and thought we were a social events planning and kind of like a dating service yeah. and um, totally, totally misread what our agenda was and what his role would have been there and it was the, the most interesting interview process I've ever gone through in my life. Um, during that time we found Arlie Clausen Again, another Mennonite came from a uh, um, social service background, um, and she did some very fine work, but then left us for MCC. Um, and then we found Trudy Bull, and uh, I think that was the, the beginning of kind of coalescing the vision of it being an integrated group that could move forward and respond and be responsive to the needs of the community. But then to do that, we had to have some way of, of hearing what people said. And I remember the birth of um, kitchen table talks and uh, walls full of stickies. I don't know how many different kitchen table talks we did. I just loved the name, it stuck. And um, it was really hearing what people thought about the community and what they felt that the community needed. So it wasn't um, somebody on a high looking over to see what needed to be put in place, but the people who lived here really saying what they thought needed. And, and that was interesting to get real people's voices because people come from all over to Kitchener and it was a great way to um, tap into that expertise and that experience from other places in the world. I remember um, a real multicultural flavor too. So there was uh, some you know, interfaith groups that joined in that conversation. And I remember a, a women's multicultural group joining in that, that discussion too. And, and it was um, getting back to basics, I think. And, um, and I remember the Festival of Neighborhoods too, a way of, of celebrating the diversity. And I, I kind of giggle now when I see that uh, Toronto basically calls themselves the city of neighborhoods. And I thought, it started here, it started here. Um, I think the different components of it, like when I joined up, they were very, I didn't understand how they fit together, but it seemed, it seemed that they could be feeding each other. And Trudy reminded me of track, and I can't remember what it, what it all stood for anymore, but it was a way of using the information to feed the, to inform the decision making. And I think that was something that got lost at the beginning, and I think we were, at the end of my tenure anyway, we were trying to come back to that. How, how can the Social Planning Council and the, and the Community Information Center feed each other? And it, it made sense if you've got people calling for help, what kinds of calls are being made? That was a, a, a little litmus test into what was needed in the community. And that should have been informing the kinds of, of social development that was happening too. Um, instead of where the pots of money were. Um, so I, I think that, that was something that um, Trudy and I agreed upon, and it's, it seems to have, have come full circle, or maybe we're just coming to fruition now. Um, and we were just talking a little bit earlier that we had this vision of how that could feed each other, but we, we didn't have the technology or the tools at the time to make it happen, but it seemed like it should have made sense. So it, it'd be very interesting for me to see now how those tools are being used. Yeah, there's a really great book by um, uh, Shirky, I think his last name is called Cognitive Surplus. And um, it, it's a beautiful way of using technology and all this time that, that people have as, and as a way of connecting people to get jobs done. And um, I think that that would be my little vision of utopia, utopia moving, moving forward as a way to use technology to, to bring people together and build bridges between people instead of using it as a, as a form for shooting people down. Okay. So the final question is, if you could give a message about your life and experience to younger generations, what would that be? Um, 
as a teacher, I've always told, whether it, it be young teachers that I'm mentoring or students, I've always said, never turn down free education or free travel. And I've, I've done that myself. I've taken advantage of exchanges or, or those kinds of things. But really what it boils down to is building a community. So never turn down an opportunity to build community. And I think that's what makes our, our schools strong. That's what makes all of our institutions strong. When people feel like they belong somewhere and they feel like they have something to contribute. And um, I think over the years, that's what I saw social planning councils ultimately trying to do was give people a voice to contribute and, and help weave the fabric of this community.